Okay, I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody to today's uh, training session for MobilityNet. My name is Abby James and today um, we're running a one of our online training sessions um, free as it's an introductory session called Introduction to Digital Accessibility. And this is part of the support we're providing at, under the current situation to help people who are much more reliant on online resources and remote working at the moment. So just to let you aware, we are recording the session today um, and that will be made available to anybody who's attending afterwards. So just some other housekeeping as well. As you can see, there is live captions going on during the tra training. Um, when you get the recording, there will also be a transcript available as well. If you have any questions or problems during today's session, uh, please put them into the Q&A panel um, that's part of Zoom. There isn't a live chat panel today on today's session because that can cause some accessibility issues. So we're trying to just keep everything into Q&A. Uh, but I do have colleagues who are monitoring that Q&A session uh, throughout today's training and they'll help you with any answers um, that can be to do with running the session. Um, I'll also be pausing through the training so that I can have a look at any questions and try and answer them. And there'll be a Q&A period at the end. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing the recording and a transcript afterwards. We'll also make the slides available as well. And um, also, uh, we'll be asking you to fill in a feedback form um, after the uh, session as well. So just going to check that everything is ready. Okay, so uh, one thing can um, you make sure you can use the Q&A panel. Um, and make sure that that is working correctly. So if uh, just see if somebody can add in a question for us and we'll test that that's working. Hi, yes, hello, Barbara. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll ask Gurman, who's my colleague, who can uh, clear, clear up the Q&A panel. I can see that wrong. Somebody's asked, how long is this training? This training is, it's actually an hour and a half session. Um, Realise that's quite a long time for some people, but as I said, it's recorded. So if you do need to drop out, please feel free. But this is how we run our online training sessions as well, which leads me nicely into the next slide. Um, so we run um, training sessions um, about two to three times a month, always 1 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, and these are some of the sessions over the next few weeks. So today we're doing Introduction to Digital Accessibility. Uh, next week, uh, my colleagues James and Jess from our accessibility consultancy team will be running Introduction to Do-It-Yourself Accessibility Testing. So that is very much aimed at non-developers. So it's actually how managers, content creators, anybody can do some accessibility testing. It's a really good way of just like getting an idea of what the accessibility is on your site. On first Thursday in May, we will be running a session particularly for designers. Um, that will be led by Alice, uh, another consultant, who will be going through some of the things that designers need to think about, how that influences accessibility when planning websites. And then on the 14th of May, James and Jess will be back to talk more about accessibility evaluations and testing results. So that's actually when we are starting to look at accessibility auditing and QA, QA testing approaches as well. Um, those sessions are paid for, but this one we are doing free of charge and the recording will be available so that anybody who wants to get that basic introduction before attending those more advanced courses can also come back and review this. Uh, we also have a series of training sessions planned throughout uh, June and July, so please go to the URL to find out more. Okay, so what are we going to cover today? This is a general introduction to accessibility why accessibility um, in digital platforms is important. So we're gonna to touch on inclusive design and how that overlaps with accessibility. And then going through a very high level view of accessibility standards, why they're important when you're creating inclusive digital platforms. I mentioned we'll be pausing for questions throughout. There'll be some polls to get you doing a bit of interactivity. We've got about, uh, 60 people on today's training. So um, with our online training courses, we normally have a smaller audience to encourage a bit more interactivity, but we're still gonna try and do it with you today um, to get you doing some polls and uh, maybe even trying out looking at a website as well. 
So let's get started into the actual topic today. Um, accessibility, it's first of all about people. It's not about focusing primarily on disability and technology. It's all about people. And um, one of my colleagues, a uh, professor when I was working at university said, actually computer science is, is, is the only field where we talk about users, apart from when we're talking about drugs and users. Actually, we always talk about users, but what they really are, are people. That's fundamentally the core of what we're doing when we're talking about accessibility. So first of all, I'm gonna get you doing your first bit of um, interactivity. I'm gonna ask you to do a poll. Now, in this poll, I'm gonna be asking you to reflect on these two photographs that you can see on the screen at the moment. On, on the photograph in A, we've got a person in a wheelchair going up a ramp towards an entrance. And on the photograph on B, we've got a person uh, climbing up some steps. We can just see their feet and legs. So I'm gonna ask you to think about in this photo who you think is disabled. So if you can't see the poll, which if you're on a mobile device, you might not be able to see the poll, then you can use the Q&A panel to reflect on how you think the, uh, the answer should be done. So the answers you can give are A, B, both, neither, or don't know. Uh, so I'll just give you a few seconds to answer that. Got 60% answered so far. Ah, we've got 55% so far saying don't know. And I think we're nearly there with everybody voting. So that's really good to see you all actively involved. And um, I'm gonna end the poll there. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna share the results with you. Uh, so interestingly, um, most of you say don't know. So that's really good um, because that's actually really the answer. You can't assume that you know somebody is disabled or not um, just by a photograph like this. Um, and while many people might assume that the person in a wheelchair is disabled, actually in that situation, they're able to move up a ramp and get into the entrance. What they receive, their experience when they get to a door may be different, but in that particular situation, um, they may not be uh, disabled as such. And the reason why we like to highlight that scenario is because being disabled isn't about necessarily having a label or an impairment. Disability happens when barriers exist between people and their environment. And that's the critical thing when we're talking about digital accessibility and digital platforms, because um, as website developers or app developers or content creators or video makers, we make that environment, we define it, and therefore we potentially could be making people disabled if we don't think about their needs and how they want to access it. So accessibility can be viewed as the ability for everyone to access and benefit from something such as a website or app. It's about that universal right to access and to be getting the same experience. And accessibility is about finding and dismantling the barriers to entry and use. And some of the things we'll be talking about today is about how we identify those barriers, but particularly how we identify them as early as possible to remove them before it becomes difficult and expensive to do. So anybody who has been involved with development of technology, uh, websites and apps will know that fixing bugs gets exponentially more expensive the later you pick them up and have to fix them. So if we can think about accessibility barriers, potential barriers really early on, then we can fix them, remove them, make sure that they never happen, they never go live. And this approach is all based around the social model of disability. And that's when people are disabled, disabled by the barriers in society and not by the impairments and differences. Or differences. And these barriers can be physical um, or they could be caused by people's attitudes towards difference. So that can be lack of awareness as well. And with digital content, people are disabled by inaccessible code and design or content as well. And the key thing with the social model is not necessarily about having a diagnosis or label, which is like a medical model. Um, it is actually about the impact. So some people may be disabled some of the time, but not always. Uh, personally, I'm dyslexic. I don't consider myself disabled, but I have been put in situations where I've gone, I can't cope with this. I never thought I could, um, would have these barriers. So in that situation, I felt disabled because of my environment. 
and in the UK and in Europe and, and many parts of the world, um, legislation around ensuring that there is equal access for people with disabilities is based around this social model. So uh, for the, uh, in the UK where we have the Equality Act, um, the Equality Act defines a disability as a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on your ability to do normal daily activities. Um, substantial and long-term have definitions around them. Normal daily activities depends on you. So for a child that might be access to education. For somebody who is work age that might be around employment. Um, for somebody who is uh, retired then it may be about doing daily activities, leisure activities. So there is um, flexibility on normal daily activities as well. So disability is caused by the way society is organised rather than a person. When barriers are removed, disabled people can be independent, autonomous and equal in society. I'm sure many of us know uh, great examples of people who have, um, are really at the forefront of demonstrating that um, disability is not a barrier to, to life and success. Now, having said that we don't talk about labels, um, we do group people into impairment types when we are talking about accessibility and accessibility needs. So we always have to sort of make some, um, some uh, sort of generalizations um, and we try and make those as little as possible. But when we are talking about how people interact with digital platforms, uh, we tend to think about them in four different groups. The first one being mobility and touch. Um, and each of these have a huge range. So mobility and touch can be some ranging from someone with um, upper limb difficulties. So they may not be able to use a mouse or a keyboard. Uh, they may be using eye gaze to detect uh, where somebody is looking at on the screen and activate controls. Or it may be somebody who has a tremor or coordination difficulties. With vision, again, a huge range. That can be from somebody who is colorblind, who may not even be aware that they have a visual difficulty through to mild, moderate vision impairments, and, and then through to people who have no sight, who are interacting with digital platforms through uh, either audio or sensory through bra braille touch and, and um, haptic feedback. Then we have hearing and communication. Um, so that might be um, a hearing impairment or it might be a speech related disorder. So that's uh, where somebody may not be able to interact with a voice control device because they have to hear it and they have to speak to it. And then uh, finally, another very big category, cognitive and learning, which can range from dyslexia, dyspraxia, specific learning difficulties, autism spectrum disorder, uh, mental health difficulties, attention difficulties due to anxiety or medication, through to age-related um, uh, mental faculties um, being affected by age-related disorders and dementia as well. So that is a huge range. Um, those that are more sensory related and physical barriers have always been documented uh, in, a, in a much greater way within accessibility because we can very more easily say if it's a pass-fail barrier. When we start to talk about communication, cognitive and learning, um, often um, accessibility needs are much more difficult to say if they can be achieved because um, it's a very um, wide range of solutions that are needed. So um, why do we need to think specifically about digital accessibility requirements? Um, and I've already mentioned about people using assistive technology. There's a huge range of assistive technology out there. Um, every computer we have, every phone we have, every tablet we have has a huge range of tools that can be used for personalizing interaction from whether it's speaking um, to the device to control it, whether it is um, uh, the uh, interacting with it through um, a screen reader or magnifying it or using a different device such as a large key keyboard. But often what we hear when people aren't aware of digital accessibility is we don't have any assistive technology users. That's quite a frequent phrase I hear, but why would you know? Can't I make a special website for a screen reader user? Everyone can use touch screens. Um, one of the uh, interesting facts I always like to tell developers and designers is, you know, you, you have that typical thing of, of somebody who's old bashing away at a touchscreen phone and they're going, well, you know, that's just because they're not familiar with technology. Well, actually, as we get older, we, the nerves lose sensitivity in the ends of our fingers. Uh, and um, that means there's less electrical signals going through to the end of our fingers. So touchscreens 
don't detect so well on people who are older. So actually having bigger touch target sizes is really important even for elderly who have the coordination ability, but it just gives more of a area on the screen to touch. So I'm gonna put up my second poll and I'm gonna try and get an idea from you um, about if there's any accessibility solutions you may have used. Um, I've got some examples up here, ramps, cut curbs, captions, which we've got going on below the screen, browser zoom, keyboard navigation, screen reader, speech recognition, or none of the above. If there's anything that you have used that's not on there, um, then, uh, we, um, then please add it into the Q&A session. I'm just gonna bring up the next poll. Okay, here we go. So, asking which of these accessible solutions have you used before um, and there's a list there so fire away and start voting there's so lots of answers coming in somebody said speech recognition So what I find really interesting about the last few years is some things like voice control devices, speech recognition. Um, they were originally assistive technology when I started 20 odd years ago. Um, now we all have them. Um, I can talk to my car and it can do things. Um, I can ask uh, devices all around my house to do to control my lights, my heating, etc., which was really complicated assistive technology a few years ago. Okay, so we've got 91 votes in. Um, it's been a, a really nice mix there, so I'm going to just end the poll and share it with you. There we go. So um, lots of people have used captions, and that's a really uh, great thing. Obviously, it's going on on the screen now, um, but even large organisations, businesses are all very aware of the advantages of providing captions on things like uh, YouTube videos, Facebook videos, because sometimes you don't necessarily want to just listen to them. And there's been some interesting feedback recently um, in the media about how it can help literacy as well, that actually having captions coming up on screen um, can help early reading as well. Um, and then we have uh, screen and browser zoom again most of us can work sometimes on small screens and we have to zoom in particularly if it's like a pdf file uh, keyboard navigation so that's when we're moving around uh, a web page using just the keyboard um, instead of using a mouse and we're going to touch a bit more back on that text to speech or reading aloud on screen text again that's built into all our computers and phones that's 54 percent so those are all people a lot of people have used those but we've also got devices our cars can talk to us um, and devices through the through the uh, house so 33% of you have used the screen reader um, and about 48% of you have used voice control devices um, speech recognition but what's really interesting is 4% of you have said none of the above so that's great to see that many of you have accessed um, lots of different types of assistive technology okay so I'm going to talk a bit about the importance of accessibility. I've already touched on the law and um, a bit about um, how the social model focuses on um, barriers and removing barriers for disability, but there is also some other legal, business and moral and universal benefits that we need to think about. So from a business perspective, from those of us who are trying to encourage people to use digital platforms and services, um, um, there's estimates of about 15% of the world population is disabled. Um, that's actually higher in the UK and many Western communities, so up to 20% um, in the UK. 80% um, of them, 80 of them are of working age, um, although you're much more likely to become disabled as you become older. And in the UK, what we've called the purple pound, um, the people who may have access needs um, may not be able to access businesses physically when we're allowed to go out um, is estimated to be worth over 274 billion pounds a year so huge potential market there and disabled people are the fastest growing minority group um, and there's a really good resource from um, a project called big hack that's run by scope 
and they've put together a business case of lots of these facts and they've done surveys of disabled people and their most recent reports have found that 75% of the, their respondents say UK businesses are losing out because their digital products and services are not designed well enough for them. And what we see particularly with online services is that people are much more likely to just click away and not buy anything or not use a service, uh, not book tickets or do any interaction if they come across an accessibility barrier. They're not going to complain, they'll just walk away and you'll never hear about them um, and you'll lose the business. What about the legal case? Well, I've already touched on the Equality Act, which came in in 2010. And um, that requires organisations, all organisations, to do not to discriminate uh, against people with disabilities. And when it comes to websites, it's what's called indirect discrimination, in that if you know your website has an accessibility issue, you are then limiting access for that disabled person and you must provide a reasonable adjustment. Now that reasonable adjustment might be through making sure your website is accessible or providing an alternative service. So it could be that somebody can request a large print version of a document or something like that. There's also specifically laws now for public sector bodies which meet, require them to meet accessibility standards. Um, which is uh, we'll go into in a bit more detail. So there are additional requirements for public sector bodies. But globally, across the globe, 84% of countries have laws protecting the rights of persons with disability. And 49% of countries define accessibility to cover digital platforms. So where they have any policies or laws about accessibility, nearly 50% now include digital in that and that's because at a global level the United Nations Charter for the Rights of Disabled People talks about the right to access to information, the right of access to services and access to products as well. So that's sort of the legal framework as well and specifically there are many countries that have laws that refer to digital accessibility both in the private sector and the public sector. Um, so the most important ones to think about um, at the moment are on the right hand side um, where we have countries like Norway and Korea specifically saying you must meet accessibility requirements when you produce an, a website or app. Um, in Europe the EU passed the European Accessibility Act in 2019 which over the next 10 years will roll out into specific private sectors such as ebooks, e-banking, computers, kiosks for ticket purchasing which will make sure that they all meet accessibility standards. Most countries have some form of public sector requirements around accessibility, whether through purchasing or development. Um, I've already mentioned the UK's public sector body accessibility regulations, and they come from the EU requirements. So all EU countries have to meet that, but also the US, Canada, Japan, China, lots of countries have that as well. So while there's the non-discrimination legal framework, there is also specific laws around digital accessibility. So I'm just gonna pause for a second and check if there are any questions. Um, I can see that um, in the question panel, somebody's asked about access to slides. We will have those. Um, there's a question around the purple pound spend. Is there a breakdown that shows the impact of not making a business to business web journey accessible? It's hard to convince senior stakeholders otherwise. We will be sharing the slides afterwards. I would suggest going and looking at the big hack um, scope and I might ask uh, Mark or German, my colleagues who are on there, if they can put the link into the Q&A pane for you so you can see those resources. And I know Mark specifically knows a lot about this field. Um, question from Jane. Do we know what legislation will be followed in the UK after the end of year when we leave the EU? So the public sector bodies um, regulations is UK law. It's come from the EU, but it's in our statute books. So it's here to stay. The part of it that might change is how it's monitored and how that information is reported because currently we will supply that monitoring information to the EU. Um, and from the point of view of the government, those regulations are really only saying to public bodies, you're doing what you should be doing under the Equality Act and you're publishing an accessibility statement. In terms of the EU Accessibility Act, what we're hearing is that won't come into UK law specifically, um, but there are questions still from the European side of 
if you are selling services into the EU, whether that will be something that you're required to follow. So there's still some sort of work around actually how that will be implemented, um, which will have to come out in the next year or two. Uh, so keep listening. Um, but anything that you intend to sell into the EU um, potentially could be covered by that um, Accessibility Act as well. Okay, so just moving now on to some a bit more about actually the process of making sure that digital platforms are accessible. Um, one thing to remember about accessibility is impairments are not always permanent um, and there's a really great resource that Microsoft has been involved in developing called the Inclusive Design Toolkit. Um, the link's wrapped a bit bare badly but it's microsoft.com slash design slash inclusive and they talk a lot about the fact that impairment can be permanent, it can be temporary, it can be situational. So what was really interesting about the poll earlier was that many of you, 80% odd, had said you'd use captions and potentially that was because you were in a situation where you didn't want to hear audio or um, you couldn't hear audio. So that was like a situational disability or impairment. Um, but likewise, it could be temporary, it could be an ear infection that's reduced your hearing, or it might be a permanent disability. Um, likewise, uh, if you're outside and you're trying to look at your phone in really bright sunshine and you can't see it on low cut because it's so bright, that's much harder um, for content to be seen if there's a low contrast between it. But as we get older, we also lose the ability to see uh, content where there's low contrast as well. So that's situational, temporary, becoming a permanent uh, visual effect as well. So um, often when we're talking in training, if it's face-to-face -face or online, if you start to get people thinking about when they've had these impairments, they can also actually understand that um, accessibility may be an absolute requirement for some people to access a service or product, but it can also be temporary or situational, something that will benefit everybody. And the other thing is that um, accessibility and usability overlap. So usability is about designing products to be effective, efficient and satisfying. Uh, UX, user experience is a growing field. Um, we know that to do successful products, they've got to be easy to use and effective. And inclusive design is a design methodology that ensures that products or services are useful, easy to use and engaging for as many people as possible. And what that means in reality is that we are trying to find that crossover, so my diagram's gone a bit skew, uh, where usable and accessible overlap and usable and accessible is the goal. Because technically we can create something that can be accessible but is still really not a nice user experience. Particularly for people who are using lots of assistive technology, whether a screen reader or switch access, you can make it technically accessible, but it takes them so long to use that they're not gonna use it and they're gonna walk away. So that's where we're really ideally wanting usable and accessible to overlap. And to ensure that something is as accessible as possible, we focus on accessibility standards. And this is where some people start to sort of get bulked down into the detail. I'm going to try and uh, keep it as understanding why these accessibility standards are important. So um, essentially, if we don't have standards and criteria that are universal, then every time you went to a product or service with assistive technology, uh, you wouldn't know if it would be able to work with your particular solutions. So standards such as how web content is opened in various different browsers allow us to be independent of a technology platform, and it's the backbone of the internet. Accessibility standards are developed by experts from all over the world and they cover all access and needs. So they bring together people with varying different um, experience and, and particular focus and they try and come to a consensus over what is the minimum required for, for digital platforms to be successful. And um, the way they are then presented as, is as success criteria or testable statements. So there is a, is a testable statement saying you must be able to do this on your website. Some of those can be um, quite easy to understand. Some of them can be quite technical um, in terms of looking at specific coding as well. And accessibility standards have to be testable 
to say whether somebody is meeting a requirement, but they don't cover all aspects of accessibility, particularly more design related or usability related. So an example of that is um, we don't say a minimum font size. There's recommendations out there about what your minimum font size should be, be to be readable. Um, the accessibility requirement is that somebody can come along and if they find your font size is too small, they can change it. So they can adapt it and make it bigger to suit them because that covers everybody's needs, um, but they don't make a design requirement out of it. And um, accessibility standards um, and principles are um, based around four, four topics. They are called, in a shortened to an acronym PAW, um, which is nice for everybody to remember. And that's because uh, the first group is perceivable. Content is presented in ways that can be accessed by all. The second requirement is operable. Content is presented in ways that can be operated by all. Third one is understandable. Content is presented in ways that can be un understood by all. And then the final one, it's a bit more technical, robust. Content is reliable and are compatible with assistive technology and standards. So um, the final one is making sure all the bits of Jigsaw come together and can work on different platforms with different assistive technology, whereas perceivable, operable and understandable can be anything from the content you create to how it is put together within your web pages and apps as well. So I'm going to ask another poll. So I jumped ahead. Um, so in terms of accessibility standards, what you will hear people talk about a lot is something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or they are shortened to the acronym WCAG, W-C-A-G. Um, and these are the main st accessibility standards that have been created. Uh, they started off over 20 years ago with version one. Uh, we went to WCAG 2 in 2008 and WCAG 2.1 in 2018. And we're currently working on 2.2 which will hopefully um, will be next year. So they're trying to add, update them more frequently because they're recognizing that digital platforms, things like mobile devices, touchscreens, voice control, has changing very quickly. And um, many of the laws that I referred to earlier are based around meeting um, WCAG standards. There's another standard for those of you who are in the UK or in Europe or even Australia, you might hear referred to, which has a lovely name called EN301549. Um, and that was a European standard developed by an organization called Etsy. And um, it is aligned to WCAG 2.1. So it, when you go into it, it will say you must meet WCAG 2.1. The reason uh, why I'm referring to it here is that is the standard that is mentioned within European procurement legislation and public sector legislation and Australian legislation as well has an Australian version of it. And it's not just web content, it's also documents. Uh, software, mobile apps, and it also covers things like telephony um, standards. So if you were thinking, I'm not just web, go and have a look at the 301549 standard as well, because um, that might help you a bit broader, but essentially they are aligned and mapped to each other. So another poll for you. Um, have you ever tested a website or document or digital content for accessibility? Four options. Uh, never um, seen accessibility statement, seen accessibility reports, but have not undertaken testing, done a few simple tests, or confident with undertaking accessibility checks. So let's launch that and see what answers we get. So about 80% of people have voted. Okay, uh, just give a few more seconds, a few more coming in. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, let's just show the results. So 30% uh, of you have never done some accessibility testing. Uh, so hopefully after today, you'll understand some of the things that you might be able to attempt. If you are able to join the testing um, DIY testing training session next week, you'll be getting a really good basis of some basic tests you can do. 
49% um, of you have done a few simple tests, so you have a little bit of a basis. Um, so hopefully this will give you a framework of where it all sits in. And 12% of you are experts um, and know confident doing tests. And that pretty much is probably a really good representation of uh, many people who are involved with digital platforms um, and um, done a bit of awareness. There's a lot of people thinking I should be doing something, but I'm not really sure if I am doing the right thing. Um, so don't be concerned um, about that. I'd say that's a very typical response. So um, just also going to throw in some accessibility terminology because um, I'm aware often when we talk about accessibility requirements and what needs to be fixed, we use some terminology that can be a bit confusing even for people who are de developers. Um, the first thing we talk about is semantic markup, which is basically good old fashioned HTML. And uh, what that means is uh, it's the markup that introduces meaning to the web page rather than just presentation. So if you do know HTML, we're talking about P tags on paragraphs, we're talking about UL or OL on lists, um, headings, H1s, H2s, and styling for meaning such as bold for emphasis. So on this slide, I have bolded some things and I have a list of items, I've got bullet points. Now, if I just put them in as graphics, those bullet points, then somebody who can't see the bullets doesn't get any of that meaning. If I put them in as markup in HTML, or if I'm writing this in PowerPoint or Word and I use the bullet button, then they will hear when it's read aloud that there is a bullet and they understand that they are in a list. It might even say four items in their list. So they get that meaning. Um, headings are really important because they add structure as well. So when we're talking about semantic markup, it's all about that information that we can see if we have sight, but people who are using assistive technology may also need to get that representation. Then the other thing is programmatically conveyed or programmatically marked up, this sort of programmatically thing. And that means information that's visible is also in the code. So I've got some screenshots here to explain that. Um, so this is actually, um, taken from GovUK website, so the UK government site, which is a leading example of an accessible website. And this is a screenshot of an accordion, so collapsible sections, topic and show only, that's available in their search system. Now, if I was a screen reader user, when I get to the topic, I need to know that that's something I can interact with and that is currently collapsed. And if I pressed it, like I have done on show only, um, I need to know that it's expanded. So that's things that have to be put into the code to be sent to a screen reader user or to an assistive technology user. We've also got a checkbox that's been ticked. So I need to know when I get to a checkbox that it's something I can interact with and that it's already been checked or not checked, or if it's something selectable, selected or not selected. And that's all stuff that goes into the code behind a web page or into the document markup to explain to people. Um, how they can interact with it. And I've got a couple of screenshots here. This is, you might recognize it, it's part of the toolbars in, in YouTube. Um, so I've got a play button, very typical button, just an icon, no text on it. But as uh, if I was a screen reader user, I need to know that it's play, so it needs to have a name. And I need to know that it might change to pause when it's playing. Um, I've got lots of different buttons there, closed caption settings. Each one of those needs to have uh, a name so that when I'm going through I can hear about it. So again, we talk about accessible names in the code. That's things that are hidden um, but need to be perceived. Okay, so briefly pause just to check some questions. Let me have a look and see what we're doing. Um, somebody's talking about they're in a church and they don't like me mentioning accessibility so yeah if you are in something like a public sector like a parish council and things there is actually sort of legal obligations but there are quite really simple things you can do um, to show accessibility um, i always do the first thing i do if i'm in a room is take away people's mouse and then try and get them to do a simple thing on their website um, or make it really, really small and see if they can interact with it as well. That's always really good. Okay, just a couple of comments there. So I think we will keep going. Great. So moving on to how do we actually make digital platforms 
accessible. So I've already mentioned about the web content accessibility guidelines, very technical information once you start to go and read it. So don't go and try and Google it if you're, if you're not feeling um, up to lots of reading. Um, they do have to be very specific because you know they are used by in legal situations um, and people like myself who spend time testing um, content, we need to have something that we can go to and say, well, is this something that we need to really say has to be changed? Um, so they can be very technical in nature, but they're always built around those four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. And what I'm going to do um, for the next section of this training session is go through each of those principles and show you examples so you get an idea of actually how they applied and why we have them there. So starting off with perceivable, under perceivable there are four top level requirements. The first one is text alternatives. So um, a good way to think about that is if I was to look at the screen at the moment, um, I have an AbilityNet logo on the top of the screen. Now I need, that's text but it's an image. So if I wanted somebody who couldn't see that image to understand that information, I need to give it alternative text um, to say ability net logo or because it's actually decorative it's just there to make it look a bit pretty they might have heard it on the first slide I might say well actually they don't need to know what that image is and it's really important also that that is marked up in the code we call it a decorative image so that they don't constantly hear the same information repeated and repeated again um, we're very good at filtering information out when we're looking at a screen. Um, if you're going through it with a screen reader, everything is linear from top to bottom. You have to listen to it all. So we're always very keen to reduce the amount of images or audio clutter that we, we refer to. Um, so text alternatives is a really big thing. It's one of the biggest issues we find is um, either uh, keywords or file names or really verbose. Um, alternative text has been put in. The next requirement is time-based media captions. Everybody's um, heard about those, but also audio descriptions as well. And we'll come back to those in a bit more. The third one is adaptable. Um, and we look at, when we're talking about adaptable, we're looking at making sure that the information that's portrayed visually about how you can interact and navigate through a digital content is also available to assistive technology users and then distinguishable and that's about the visual presentation things like color contrast and uh, color blindness as well so just to give you an example of how that's written up um, talking about 1.1.1 all non-text content that is presented to the user has a text alternative that serves the equivalent purpose except for the situations below so there's lots of information there whether there are exceptions as well. So things like um, if something is a capture where you actually have an image as a security requirement, you don't have to give it alternative text. If something is time based media, so it's you know, a video, you're not going to describe that using alternative text. If something is a test, so you specifically have an, um, an exam, like I had a poll with A and B. Now, if I'd wanted you to see what was in those images, I don't have to put alternative text. I have to provide an alternative test for somebody who's blind instead. So um, somebody I can just see in the QA pane has asked, um, so with alt text, it's less more. Um, so with alt text, generally people say one or two sentences. If you have a really complex um, diagram, um, and I'm gonna skip to the next slide. I've got some graphs here. Um, so this is the type of thing where if I was doing alt text on a slide with graphs, I would put very simple alt text, which is like enough that I could skim over the slide and say, do I need more information? So it might be the title of the graph, but then I'd have to have a long description or a data table or some further information that could actually describe the whole graph and that whole content to them. So alt text is like skimming over. If you need more than alt text, short descriptions, then you need to think about, is it described in the text? Is there um, some way of accessing that information as well? So um, I just jumped on to another perceivable example. So this is a, a, a quite an important one, um, which is use of color. And often um, we see use of color in things like graphs and data tables, 
or infographics as well. And the, the reason that use of colour um, can be a problem is that if you're relying on colour to convey information, then somebody who can't see colour, that might be because of uh, colour deficiency, they can't see certain colour combinations or a visual impairment, um, or because um, they are blind, may not be able to access that content. So just to give you an example of those graphs, in grayscale, you can see that the one on the left uh, is not accessible at all because um, the data points are not marked, there's no differentiation from the shape, but the one on the right where there is data points using different shapes can be accessed in grayscale as well. So another quick test you can do on a website is always to just put everything into grayscale and see can you still access it without any color on it as well. Another critical um, issue that we see a lot and um, I've already mentioned is color contrast as well. So I mentioned that as we get older we rely more on higher contrast between text and backgrounds. Uh, bright light and sunlight can make it difficult to read low contrast we're outside and some people may not be able to distinguish between certain color combinations. So within accessibility requirements um, we have something called a color contrast ratio so there's a big algorithm that works out the luminescence and the hue difference between two colors and there are many tools available that allow you to test that and on the right hand side I've got a table which just shows you some examples. So black on white text gives you a color contrast ratio of 21 to one. But if that was yellow text, it would drop to 1.6 to one. And the threshold for readable normal size text is set at 4.5 to one. Um, but you can see that actually sometimes surprising con um, combinations work. So black on quite a bright green gives you 5.4.1. Uh, white on blue is a bit too low, 4.2. White on orange is definitely too low, uh, but black on orange is okay. Um, and that's because it also takes into account red and green hue as well. So it takes into account color blindness in the calculations. And what we recommend people do to, to cope with color contrast, the best thing to do is really early on in your design process, is look at what colors you are using, and work out which combinations will work well together and which ones you need to avoid. It can be particularly difficult if people are using brand colours that are in the middle of the colour range like orange or turquoise colours because there isn't much um, combinations that will match that for contrast. So you can see there with orange you can use black with it but you can't use white with it. Um, there is also a requirement around things like buttons or form fields that the borders meet contrast ratios um, and larger text as well but you have a bit more leeway you can have a lower contrast of three to one so that's always a good thing to remember when you are starting to plan any digital products or services um, is that uh, um, that there is good contrast there i'm just seeing there's quite a few con questions just popping up so i'm just going to try and answer them before i move on to other subjects as well so somebody has said um, do I put long descriptions on photos or just the short description? I've been putting short and long descriptions on all photos and it takes ages. Um, short descriptions are the ones to focus on, alt text. Um, it depends very much, Christina, who's answered that question, um, on what the purpose of the content is. Um, and uh, there's some very good resources on the WebAIM website, W-E-B-A-I-M, about how to go through describing images. So I'd point you in that direction. Um, somebody's asked about, I'm hearing different views about white text on black background, what's your take? So while I'm talking here about color contrast in terms of visual difficulties, um, so that's about making sure there's as much contrast as possible, there are also people who may find high contrast difficult to read. So particularly in people with dyslexia or migraines, um, may have visual stress difficulties as well. Uh, and it's quite well known, people talk about colored overlays or colored backgrounds. Now, um, I've done some research in that area, collating what studies have been done. 
and um, it's very, always very difficult to get like a perfect research answer on this one but generally um, what people have found is colors like light blue backgrounds with black text light cream backgrounds or light pink backgrounds are the ones that people say they can read best with um, the creamy buff colors or light gray colors are what generally um, everybody is quite happy looking at so just not having that clear black on white contrast just reducing the contrast levels a bit are a good way to go um, but generally when it comes to things like fonts and readability the size of font has a big impact as well so making sure you have a good font size and a good line spacing as well helps with readability um, just checking if there's any more there yeah, somebody said can designers use less contrast for larger text or do you recommend meeting 4.5 to 1 um, so if they are using larger text or bold text then yes they can use a lower contrast level 3 to 1 um, and that's because you've got more color area to differentiate between even with these color ratios if you are using a very fine font a very thin font it can still be really difficult to re read even if you're meeting those contrast ratios, because the test only needs one pixel to say, yes, you've met it. This is where the testable statements, um, you can be accessible, but it's not usable. So think about um, the actual thickness of your fonts as well. But um, good contrast is as getting it as good as possible is always recommended. Okay, just seeing if there's anything else. Um, on their own contrast ratios is there any software or web page which provides more detail on the contrast ratio um, so there's a good tool called the past yellow color contrast tool um, that allows you to test and you can also if you are in google um, if you're in chrome sorry um, if you use your inspector tool then you can hover over let me just i have a web page here if i jump up the inspector tool live demo as we talk hover over a um, text element you can see in that little pop-up it says contrast and it's got a green tick because it's saying 14.28 so these are built-in tools into browsers that allow you to test color contrast as well um, it's in chrome it's in firefox and it's in edge as well they all have these types of tools that can support color contrast okay so just uh, moving on I mentioned about adaptable so another area where we see lots of issues um, lots of concerns is about heading structure um, for those of you who come from a web development background or you know particularly have been doing web development for quite a while um, you understand about h1s and h2s and um, I've got a screenshot um, available here that shows the gov UK website and um, you can see there I've got a little tool called headings map that you can have in Firefox and Chrome that shows you the headings um, structure so it's really useful for checking um, it's also an assistive technology uh, so it allows you to actually click on a heading and jump straight to it so it allows you to skim through a web page really quickly and you can see here on the GovUK site they have headings for each of their sections well labeled up so it's a really good um, structure there is a red line on staying at home and that's because there's a banner above the one um, that's not a strict failure that's not a problem that um, it wouldn't cause somebody with a screen reader a problem but um, this tool just flags that up as a potential issue the things that we typically see wrong with heading structures is headings are used um, formatted headings are marked up not marked up as a heading semantically so what that means is something has got a big font and it's bold and it clearly separates out a section so on this screenshot it'd be things like welcome to gov uk but that programmatic markup is not there so it's just been done as styling and there's no h tags typically we will quite often see heading levels skipped so it will go two four three five so it's not a nice structure and the problem with that is that's really confusing for people who are listening to the content to understand the relative levels they are at um, jumping between sections and understanding that which might be visually presented in the styling um, 
Headings used for styling. So you might see whole paragraphs that are marked up as a heading because somebody's used it to make it look like they want to. It actually isn't a section or headings. And we will also find pages with no headings at all. Now, that's okay if it's just something like a login screen with just two fields. But if you've got content that can be put into sections, it should have headings. Um, and we still see lots of pages without headings as well. All right. Um, so captions, we've already shown that lots of people know about captions. Um, that's um, part of our accessible multimedia requirements. And um, captions give you the audio that is in a screen. Now I have a little video here. What I'm gonna actually do, because most people are aware of captions, is jump into the section about audio descriptions. Now, audio descriptions are a, are a requirement under accessibility standards, um, but they are quite difficult to deliver um, because many players aren't able to provide video, um, audio descriptions. But what they allow you to do is actually present the visual information and describe it to somebody who isn't able to see it. Um, so what we'll do is just run this video for a bit. The sound in a video, film or TV program can present barriers for people with impaired hearing, such as Susan. I'm just going to move forward. Um, as many of you know already background, about background noise, such as a telephone ringing, dog barking, or children playing. The picture in a video or TV program can present barriers for people with impaired vision, such as Carol or Maria. How well can you follow what's happening in this clip when we remove the picture? <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm really sorry. I bumped into a friend and I got talking. I've been waiting 20 minutes. Hurry up. Oh, well, I'm on my way. I probably thought it would be too long. OK. Hi, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. You're here now. Audio description can help by providing some of the missing visual information through speech. Tamsin is waiting for Anna outside the theatre. She looks annoyed and checks her watch. She takes her phone out of one of her pockets and looks at the phone. It's Anna calling. Hello? Hi, I'm really sorry. I bumped into a friend and I got talking. I've been waiting 20 minutes. Hurry up! Oh, well, I'm on my way. I probably thought it would be too long. OK. Tamsin puts the phone away. Fifteen minutes later, Tamsin is still waiting and is visibly annoyed. Anna finally arrives. Hi, I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. You're here now. They both start walking into the theatre. So hopefully that little experience of audio description has shown you as an example of what can be offered when you are able to audio describe a video which has some video content, visual content in it as well. Now, as I mentioned, it's quite technically quite difficult. Things like YouTube and Vimeo don't allow you to embed audio descriptions as an audio track. But one way of supporting people who can't see a video is to offer a transcript where you describe the actions within a video. And that can be quite uh, easy to do if you've already got a script for a video that you've created. Uh, and you can just add in descriptions of the video content as well. Um, so captions, um, I jumped over that section because many of you said you've used captions. Um, we've got them on screen as we've been talking and actually these are automatic captions that are coming up on screen. And captions provide you with the audio presentation as well. And they are embedded in most video players now having that automatic uh, caption section. But on things like YouTube, you can go into the automatic captions as um, a video owner and actually edit them and improve them as well. So while we're seeing lots of improvements in automatic captions, uh, you can make sure that they are as good as possible. And that's something we will be doing with our transcripts as well after today. So uh, somebody said, I understand that transcripts are okay for single shot to headshot videos, but audio descriptions need to be timed to the video. 
So um, with uh, audio descriptions, um, they are required for WCAG 2.1 level AA. Um, you can um, provide a transcript for level A, which is the lower a quick level run standard. Um, so you can do things like having a tracked transcript beside the video, which is available, such as in this screenshot here on, on YouTube. So you can have the transcript running alongside and moving through it. That is also um, a possibility. If your video is just something like two people talking to each other where there isn't any visual content, then again, you don't need to have that audio description because it is just um, two people talking that's described by the captions or the transcript. So moving on to the operable section, um, and uh, it was interesting, just thinking back to that poll, there was about 50% of you had said you'd done um, uh, testing with keyboard navigation. Uh, and I have to say, it's the first thing I do on any website I go to is start to use keyboard navigation to see what's going on. Um, and that's the main part, that's the first priority with the operable section but saying keyboard accessible. Um, and we'll go into a bit more of that means. Now we focus quite a lot in accessibility on keyboard because um, if you can operate a website or software with a keyboard, um, that means somebody who's using a screen reader, who's using a braille um, keyboard, um, who's using potentially a switch, who's using eye gaze can interact with that website so it's not specifically saying just for keyboard users there's a whole range of assistive technologies that rely on that keyboard access as well another important thing is enough time um, for example users are warned if they're about to be logged out i'm sure nearly everybody has had some experience with security settings uh, where they have been logged out when they haven't been aware that they're going to be um, another important thing is seizures making sure that flashing content um, isn't going to cause any particular difficulty to for users and um, navigable as well. So another thing with keyboard operation is making sure that people are aware where they they have focus and they can move around. So just looking a bit more into that that keyboard criteria, how it's written, how we test it, we say all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface without requiring specific timing for individual keystrokes except when the underlying functionality requires the input that depends on the path of the user's movement and not just the endpoint. So again, quite a technical description, but essentially you can operate everything with the keyboard. Now, what we mean by keyboard, being able to operate things with the keyboard, is the being able to move through the website using the tab key um, or the shift tab key to move back. It means anything that can be activated like a button you can do so with a space bar or with the enter key and any links can be activated with the enter key. Now, typically, if you're on a website, you can use the up and down arrows to scroll the page up and down. But if you open like a selection box or a menu, you may also be able to use the arrow keys to move up and down as well. So the important thing to do when you are testing any website for keyboard only um, access is to start using the tab key to move through it. Um, some people say, well, how do you replicate that on a touch screen? Um, if we're using it on a mobile, actually there's an equivalent action uh, for screen reader users, or we can use a Bluetooth keyboard as well to move focus through. So I'm now gonna uh, try and get you to do a bit of activity, a bit of um, a test out with this. If you're able to go to a website while you're watching this, you can do this, or you can watch along while I do it on a website at the same time. And what I would like you to do is to just um, look at the website and rate it for how well you can access it with your keyboard. So as I said, moving the tab key or shift tab back to go backwards, enter on any buttons or links, and um, also think about if there's any indicator telling you where you are on the page. And what I'll do while I give you a couple of minutes to do that is I'm going to bring up the AbilityNet website um, that I showed quickly earlier on the screen and follow that with the keyboard as well. So you can either do it on your own page or follow what I'm doing as well. So if I just get this up on screen. So, um, 
I'll just talk through what keys I'm pressing. So I've got the website up and I'm going to press the tab key. And immediately when I press the tab key, if I'm on an accessible website, then I will see a skip to content link appear. And what the skip to content button allows me to do is jump over all the navigation to the main content on the page. And that's really helpful for people who are relying on the keyboard because it means they don't have to go through the menu every single time. So if I do that, you can see it moves down to the top of the main content on the page. So if I skip beyond, move beyond that skip to content, um, you'll see I've got a red box that appears on the screen and that's my focus indicator. That's indicating where I am. So again, that's something we often see has been overridden. Um, every browser has a default focus indicator. Now it can be a nice colored one, um, which is good contrast, or it can be a really hidden one that nobody can see. Uh, I can see somebody said, if I log into a different website, um, just watch along if you can't get to a website, that's fine. Um, and as I tab through, you'll see my focus indicator moves and I'm gonna come down to this collapsible menu here and I can tab through. And then if I want to open a sub menu, I press enter and I can move through that menu as well. So um, I'm going to pop up a poll and I'm going to just give you a minute or two if you have looked at a website or you've had any experience before to think about actually what your experience is when you've been testing uh, with the keyboard or if you've attempted to test something with a keyboard. So what I'm asking you to do is just to rate your experience um, on one to five um, with one being low and five being high um, or unable to test is there as well. Can you access the navigation menus? Can you access the search box? Was there any indicator, a focus indicator to see where you are? Quite often you'll start tabbing and you'll just get lost if there isn't a focus indicator. So you've got 30% have gone. Ah, somebody on Q&A has given their website Ofcom and they've given it a four. That's a really good score. I'd say four is good. Four is good. And I'd say this is probably, um, if you start tabbing through a navigation menu, this is when you really start to see if somebody has tested it for accessibility. Um, it's one of those things where um, I, you, you, I've been with people which think they've done accessibility and then you start tabbing and very quickly you see. And one of the critical things with keyboard access is it can't be tested automatically. It does require somebody going through manually. Um, now there is a, a tool called Microsoft Insights, um, which is free, Microsoft Accessibility Insights, which has got a great tool in there for keyboard testing. It actually draws on screen where your tab has been so you can see if it's jumping across the page as well. So that's always really useful if you want to actually try and do that. <laughs> I can see somebody's from Gov UK. Um, should be a four or five, hopefully, John, if you're uh, following along on that, that's a pretty good one. So how are we doing? We've got about 46, about 67% of you have managed to vote. I'll give you another few seconds. See if we get a few more in there. Okay, so oh, a few more coming in. Somebody said, legally, does a website have to have keyboard accessibility? If there's a legal requirement to meet accessibility standards, then yes, they do need to be keyboard accessible. If, you, um, if there isn't a specific accessibility standard, if somebody can't use a mouse and they try and access your website and they can't get into it, then you may be indirectly discriminating against them. So quite often what we will see on menus like this is you can tab along the top uh, but you can't access the sub menus. You can't get into those. Um, that's a very typical thing we see on large menus. Um, and things like accordions um, and filter boxes, check boxes as well, often um, cannot be accessed with a keyboard. So that means that a lot of your site might not be available to quite a lot of users. 
Um, okay, so let's just uh, end that poll and share the results. So nice to see that a third of you, 33% of you that gave your sites four, but about the same amount gave lower than four. Um, and a few of you gave the top, but quite a few weren't able to test. But I would say to you, those of you who were not able to test, uh, the next website you go to, start pressing tab, see what you can see um, and what you experience and, and get into the habit of doing that. And that's a really good way of starting to learn about accessibility. Okay, right. So got about 20 minutes left. So moving on. So the next session section is understandable. And this is where we start to get into um, areas uh, which get a bit more complicated. So we talk about readable. Now, um, a lot of people start thinking, well, do I need to be a particular reading level? And there's a lot of recommendations around things like making sure the reading age of content is 12 or below. Now, that actually isn't in level AA of the WCAG standards, so it's not a legal requirement to say a particular reading level. And that's because it's recognized that it really depends on your audience what is the appropriate reading level. Um, if you are providing a public service, then you might think, I need to make sure everybody can access this. But that's very different to if you're writing a research paper aimed at a particular peer group of specialists who need to access very technical information and therefore it's not appropriate to reduce the reading level. But under reading readable, we do think about things like making sure the language is defined um, programmatically. And that's so if you're listening with a screen reader, uh, the voice changes to the right language. So if you have French content intermingled with English, you want it to switch to a French voice or Welsh and English is really important as well. The second requirement is predictable, so consistent navigation. And the third one is input assistance. So that is around forms and anything where you have to input information. So let's just go through some of the examples about that. Predictable and consistent, this is one of my bugbears. Um, on screen, we've got two icons at the top, one that looks like a magnifying glass, one that looks like a magnifying glass with plus in it. And most people will think magnifying glass, oh, it might be search, but at the same time, it might be zoom, particularly if it's got a plus or minus in it. Um, other ones that confuse people are arrows pointing left or back. So it could be a back button or it could be an undo button as well. So we quite often use icons um, that can mean more than one thing. And the requirement from an accessibility point of view is that they are consistently used. So if you use a magnifying glass for Zoom, then you use the same magnifying glass all the time. You don't then use it for search at the same time on the same site. Lots of problems happen around forms and form areas. And this is really important if you're on an e-commerce site or if you're providing a service to somebody where you will require them to put information in. So the typical errors we will see around forms is no indication of required fields. So um, you've got to tell somebody that a, for, a field is a required field. Um, now you can write at the top, all fields are required. You can put an asterisk next to every question which people understand, but that still is really difficult for some people to remember that every field is required or remember that an asterisk means required as well. Um, and somebody who is a screen reader will just hear asterisks. They won't hear that that's required. So things around required fields can be very complicated. We've already talked about color being a problem if you're only indicating color, but that in forms, they are often used to present errors that red is used to present errors. And I've got a screenshot on the right here of a bad form uh, where the first two questions have errors that are just indicated by changing the color of the question. Now, if you can't see color, you don't know which question has an error. Um, another big problem is error messages that don't provide enough support. So again, um, on the right, which is your favorite city park, it's not telling me that it's a required field. There's nothing there to help me fill this form in. Um, and as somebody with dyslexia, if I'm presented in a form like this, oh, I just turn away, go away and not do it. And then another, the final common problem, error messages are not linked to the fields they refer to. And that's a particular problem for people who are using assistive technology. They have error messages maybe at the top of the screen or they are um, 
completely independent they don't know where they've got to fix the problems and that can also be problems for people who have changed the size of the screen the error messages are disconnected or have cognitive processing difficulties you just don't you can't make that connection it's not telling me at the bottom of the screen i've got an example of good messages so i've got a field here that's saying okay with a green tick and then error expiry date and it's telling me the problem is use the right format mm slash yyy instead of a dot so that's a good example of um, um, error messages in a form. Then moving on to our final section of the accessibility requirements. This is, um, I refer to, it's quite technical, it's robust, and it's all about making sure everything works together um, with assistive technology. But there's one requirement in there that causes the most difficulties for anything that is interactive. Um, and it's name role value. And what that means, to give you some example, is when anything has um, any interactivity with it, we need in the code for there to be an accessible name. So if you remember back to right at the beginning where we had a picture of the YouTube play button, that is a button. So I need to know it's the play, it's got a name, I need to know what it does, so I give it a role, it's a button. And if I, as a screen reader user, an assistive technology user, know it's a button, that I know I can interact with it in a certain way, I can press enter, and it might have a value or state associated with it. So to point that, go back to that example where we had an accordion. Um, so I've just seen a couple of people have said, oh, they've missed bits because connections, there is a recording, so you will get it back at the end. Um, so I'm just showing you an example um, on the screen of an accordion, so collapsible filters. Um, and trying to explain what name role value means for these. So if we look at the top um, accordion part where we have topic, you remember I said that uh, somebody needs to know whether that's expanded or collapsed. So for this requirement, um, I need to know that the name is topic because that's the text that's associated with it. I need to know that it's, it's got a, it's a button, I can interact with it. Also, I would need to know that it controls something. What, what can I do with this? So I'd actually maybe be told that there's a panel underneath it that's gonna, what the name of that panel is. And I need to know that currently its state or value is that it's collapsed. So that's the type of information that all needs to be put into the code on an accordion. The second example we have here is a checkbox. And again, um, this checkbox has got a, a label already, it's on screen, it's services, but I need to know that that service is, is associated with that checkbox, that's what it refers to. I need to know that it's a checkbox, so as somebody using assistive technology, I can select it or not select it. Um, and then I need to know whether it's checked or not. So with anything that we can interact with, um, if you're doing an accessibility test, we have to look at whether it's got a name, a role or a value. Now, um, this is something that you either have to use um, testing tools specifically to look at, but this is something that can be done by automatic tools or actually going through with screen readers and assistive technology to identify. From a layman's point of view or a manager's point of view, it's important if you're designing or asking for these type of interactive components to think about making sure these accessibility requirements are built in and defined for developers. So particularly if you're doing any designers, um, signing or user experience, you should consider these types of values that you need to um, make sure the developers do, as well as just how it looks on the screen as well. So that's been a very quick run through of the accessibility requirements. We've got 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna just go through some sort of summary bits of things of where do you take it from now? And then hopefully have um, a few minutes at the end to answer any remaining questions that we've got. So I've got, talked about some common issues. Um, there's a really big study that was being done for the last two years by WebAIM, which is a part of a university in the US. And they scanned the top 1 million sites across the globe and what they can pick up automatically. Um, and also this has been their list of most common issues plus some more that we know you can detect from manual testing. So the most common issues across all websites is insufficient color contrast or use of color for meaning. And that's simple things you can test um, with color contrast tools or making everything grayscale. Missing alternative descriptions on images. That's one of the biggest things that still happen. Lack of keyboard access, missing focus indicators form fields, missing programmatic information and error messages, 
incorrect heading structures and captions, transcripts or audio descriptions missing on videos. So all the things I've mentioned today are the top hit things that happen across all websites as well. There are many more accessibility requirements, but these are the ones that have the biggest impact and are most commonly seen. But having seen all those issues and seen quite a lot of technical information, you might now be thinking, well, how, how do I make all these um, accessible products and services? How do I actually do it? And I'm just going to say, sit back, take a deep breath. Uh, my mantra, I say it in every training session, is accessibility is a journey, not a destination. It's something that as long as you're thinking about all the time and trying to improve, you, you will make steps towards it. Um, and even if you could just tackle one thing like your color contrast that will improve the experience for some people and it's important to embed accessibility through policies processes and quality insurance it's important that everybody who has design content procurement and technical requirements is aware of it so it will if you're in an organization require everybody to have some understanding of accessibility and know what they need to do um, there's five stages of accessibility acceptance. It's like the five stages of grief. When you start talking about it, people will say, no one complains. People don't use assistive technology within our website. Then they will be, it's not my problem. Don't tell me how me to do my job. Then it will be particularly from the developers. I can do a hack. I can do it this way, which will sort of work. Is that enough? Then they'll look at all these requirements and go, I can't do this, there's too much here. And then they'll start to say, okay, I see what needs to be done, we're working on a strategy, but you can only get there if everybody is involved. And there's always that uh, process you have to go through with people accepting change as well. So um, for those of you who've said, you know, how do I get people to take this seriously? How do I take this, um, how do I get this embedded? Um, it can take many, lots of time, lots of efforts, but people will get there. Um, and actually often showing people particular little problems they've got, like keyboard access, color contrast, um, showing it on a mobile phone, trying to zoom it as well. Um, they start to understand the types of problems that they can fix. I've already mentioned many people are involved in digital accessibility, designers, color, content creators, developers, um, but also think about procurement as well. If you are going out and getting people to make videos for your sites or designing websites or creating PDF documents, they need to think about accessibility. And I've added on the end there, senior managers, because what we know with accessibility and disability equality generally is unless you've got somebody at senior management leading it, it can be really always a struggle to get it embedded. So make sure you get senior managers involved as well. Okay. And with a few minutes to go, that's the end of the training session. I can see I've got a few questions that have popped up as well. And do feel free to ping in some questions if you've got some left as well. And just as a reminder, um, if you do want to learn more, we have got more training sessions coming up. Um, they are chargeable sessions, um, but we try and make them as, as cost effective for, for everybody being involved as well. So today we've done Introduction to Digital Accessibility. Uh, and there'll be some more about testing coming up, as we mentioned, with designers. And also, looking forward, we'll be having some that are specifically for developers as well, which go into the more technical, interactive components as well. Um, so do go to abilitynet.org.uk slash training um, to find out more. And finally, just uh, uh, a request. Um, AbilityNet is a charity. We provide these free events and our free webinars. Um, they're supported by donations. If you are able to consider donating, then please go to abilitynet.org.uk slash donate so we can continue to provide free events like this and also um, provide support through our helpline and our volunteer network as well. So finally, um, in the last five minutes, um, I'm just going to have a look at the questions and see if there's anything outstanding um, that, um, let's see what's there. So, um, and if German, who's been looking at my questions panel, supporting me, if he's seen anything, he can jump in and say, um, I can see somebody, somebody said there, um, the anger response is what I've experienced. I thought it was just, me that got this reaction. Um, unfortunately, um, yeah, people seem to think that this is um, often like an extra job they're being asked to do. Um, if I'm working with developers and designers, it's often 
trying to work with them to think about if they want to do their job well. Um, often once they see it's been how it how people with assistive technology interact with their sites and actually that they're getting a really poor experience that then can actually help them reflect as well so if you have anybody who um, you know who has disability or accessibility needs um, poor sight always really good to get them to come in and, and show somebody um, actually what it's experienced so there are empathy labs around there are local charities as well we always strongly recommend having user testing as well with diverse users to get that wide range of experience. Um, so somebody saying here about um, they love to have um, video with strobes or rapidly changing lights online. Is there any literature or a test that can refer them to um, videos through to figure out if it's a problem? Um, yeah, so um, yes, there is um, some testing tools specifically to do with um, flashing lights. So there are requirements about how many times it flashes within a minute. Um, and uh, we can um, put out, have a look on my Twitter feed, which is at Abby James, A-B-I-J-A-M-E-S. And I will tweet something after this. And we will also see if we can get that onto the AbilityNet Twitter feed as well because I can't remember it off the end of my um, top of my net head um, and also um, at AbilityNet as well we'll post it. Somebody you've also mentioned about autoplay videos. Autoplay videos are um, an accessibility failure. They cause people lots of headaches sort of the constant moving motion um, and also for if you've got any audio behind them, somebody who is a screen reader user will have that audio playing over theirs. So the absolute requirement is for um, you to have a, if anything is moving for more than 20 seconds, then you must have an ability to stop or pause it. Um, there is a fashion at the moment to have auto playing videos in the background when you go to a website and that is something we commonly have to raise as an accessibility issue. You need to have some way of stopping it and pausing it as well. Okay and I'm just having a look to see if there's any more questions and I think we're just about at the end. Um, oh no, a few more topped in. We normally add captions to our videos with a transcript. Is there anything else we need to do to improve the accessibility? Um, so think about in your transcript having any information about what's happening on screen as well, any visual information that will help somebody who can't see that video have the same experience. So that's a really good um, way of helping people who can't interact with the video directly. If you do have an important video and you are able to add an auto describes function, uh, uh, auto describes audio track, that is also a good one as well. Um, great. What about British Sign Language? Um, so actually in the accessibility requirements, there isn't anything specifically at level AA to do with sign language. Um, sign language is very localised as well. Different countries have different versions of sign language. Whereas if you have captions or transcripts, they can be translated. Um, but it's always um, an option to think about of having somebody um, signing important videos. At the moment, um, some people are starting to look at avatars and automatic conversion to sign language, but the technology is still very limited um, in doing that translation and then representing it as sign language. But that's something that um, potentially in the next few years, we will see more automatic generation of sign language. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining um, uh, and jo staying on to the end. It's been great to see so many people participating. Um, just a reminder, um, we do have these um, training sessions that we are ongoing. So do have a look at abilitynet.org.uk slash training or email training at abilitynet.org.uk and they can provide you information um, about lots of different training sessions that we can offer. And I'm going to leave it there. As I said at the beginning, we will be sharing the video and the transcript and the slides as well from the session so that you can have all this information afterwards um, and hopefully disseminate it um, throughout your um, organisations as well. Thank you.